It's never happened in history. One team in a single season gets five gold gloves. Which of the five were you? I'm not the not they were saying that they were not deserving, but which of the one kind of surprised you? You know, I think you would say Tommy Edmond, but man, he was he was so good, man. I mean, his range was off the chart. You know, I, I think maybe I would have thought maybe Tyler O'Neill because what did he have? Seven errors. Yeah. So I, I think I was surprised by that. Uh, that he he got another crack at it. Uh, the other ones I wasn't you weren't surprised at Arnado. I thought Goldschmidt was definitely the best first baseman I saw this year. Um, so I, I really wasn't overly surprised, other than the fact O'Neill with the errors, and obviously errors are just part of the metrics they use in order to uh, ju- judge this award. You know what's amazing too is you got the five. They're all coming back. They're all either beginning the primes of their careers or kind of in the primes of their career. They could do this again. And, you know, doesn't Dylan Carlson have that kind of gold glove ability eventually? He does. Yeah, you you know, he he really does. And um, I I thought about that, too. Once he settles in, and and I really thought for Carlson, you know, I, I thought picking up balls was a little bit of a challenge because he was playing in ballparks with crowds in them. Uh, he was on the road a little bit more in some ballparks he wasn't familiar with. And, you know, we always remind people, you know, when you get to the big leagues, there's that upper deck plus. And like at Dodger Stadium, they have four decks if you're in the outfield to play balls off of. So, you know, I think just getting adjusted. But, you know, fundamentally, he's a really sound player, and I expect him to, to contend as well. Uh, you know, and really, Frank, it, it's a tribute to, to Willie McGee and Stubby Clapp and Pop Warner those guys work countless hours with these players well before anybody gets to the ballpark. Uh, even on days when you really don't want to do it, but they came out and they worked with them and they just weren't hitting balls. They were making sure they understood what was going on. And, um, and I know you mentioned Mike Schilt, you know, his attention to detail is part of the reason why those guys have gold gloves to go along with their skill set. So what do you think of the uh, Skip Schumacher hire? I love it. Um, you know, I said Sunday uh, last week, Friday, that there were three people that were in that category of bench coach: Skip, Stubby Clab, and Carlos Beltran. <clears throat> I would have liked to, I would have used him as well as as one of the candidates. But you know, Skip Schumacher was one of my five all-time favorite Cardinals. Period. Um, you know, great wow. interview, great person, knowledgeable guy, hard worker. Um, I always remember the year when Tony brought him in to play second base. And he told him right before spring training he was going to play second base. And he was out, and this is why I know you love him, he was out taking hundreds of ground balls every day in California getting ready. And I thought the tribute to Skip's work ethic was we opened up the playoffs that year against the Dodgers. And he, Tony and Dave Duncan were putting together what kind of lineup they wanted to have. And Dave said, we need to have defense. So he said, we need to have Skip at second base. So think about that. You know, your, your pitching coach says our best defensive guy is a guy who never played the position until spring training started. That's how hard he worked at it. And he was a good player, and I think he's going to be a very good bench coach and someday a very, very good manager. Hey, uh, educate us on this. Uh, <clears throat> was Beltran interviewed for the position? And a quick personal opinion – he screwed no, up in that. He was okay. Not. I don't know if he was or not, but I just think that, you know, if you're going to, you know, everybody who was involved in the cheating deal with Houston has been gainfully reemployed with the exception of Jeff Luno. Carlos Beltran is one of the classiest players they ever put card on uniform on, period. I know he was well thought of in the organization, especially by uh, John Mazalak, and his knowledge alone would have been very interesting to have, especially a different set of eyes on this ball club. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think he'll get a job because I think the guy's got too much class and too much knowledge to be sitting at home doing nothing, especially when everybody else who was allegedly involved in that situation has found gainful employment with the exception of Luno. A- absolutely. You would think two decades of sustained like greatness on and off the field you know, you'd get another shot. I can't believe yeah. he's going to be blackballed forever. I hope not. All right. Uh, let's get to um, some free agency thoughts. Do you think that they are comfortable in coming back with the two shortstops they have and they go the other route and bring in a, a lethal DH bat and, and maybe a, a fine starting pitcher? 
What do you think? You know, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think you want to define your shortstop as an everyday person. I don't know if that's a platoon situation because they're both right-handed hitters. Um, I, I think you need to make a decision on that. Um, you know, that's why the Seager thing could be intriguing. And I would only be interested in him because he's a left-handed bat. I think the question is, while everybody thinks that the 10-year contract is where it's at, I'm not sure, and I don't think the Cardinals would want to, you know, engage in one of those sort of deals. You know, maybe you give them more up front for a shorter period of time if that's what it's going to take. Uh, but I, I think that you got to make a decision on either it's going to be Sosa or DeYoung, not Sosa and DeYoung. I, I just don't think that platoon setup really works uh, if you go over 162 game season, because you know it'd be different if one was a lefty, but they're both right-handed hitters. So I'm not sure where the real benefit is. So are you in agreement with uh, Bob Ramsey that if there is a DH, which almost it's almost 100 percent chance it's going to happen, is that Kyle Schwarber with his 912 OPS makes a whole lot yes. of sense? There's no doubt. Um, Schwarber is turning into the player that was, I think he was fourth. He was picked fourth in the draft, his class, as a catcher. Um, you know, I like his approach at the plate. And while sometimes the average doesn't indicate how good he can be, I think that on-base percentage and just his ability to, to, A, to go the other way, B, to hit for power, B, take walks. I mean, he does a lot of little things that I think you need to have. And for a team that was left-handed deficient this past season, uh, I think he certainly checks a big box that I think you're going to need if you want to consider a more lethal team offensively. In terms of a free agent pitcher, I couldn't think of anybody who makes more sense uh, than a guy like Marcus Stroman, who will eat up innings, 180, low ERA, and will not command the salary that Max Scherzer will. He would be ideal for this team. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I would say he would be certainly in the, in the mix. But, you know, I'm a little leery because signing free agent pitchers has not been what I would deem a strong suit for the Cardinals recently. You know, I might even look to maybe make a deal for a mid-rotation guy that maybe a team says we don't want to sign him beyond next year or whatever, and, and maybe they're looking for something you have. I, I think I've, i got to kick the tires on that approach as well. In terms of uh, their starting staff next year, Wainwright, Flaherty, Hudson, Michaelis, the chance for Woodford, the chance for Reyes. Uh, I don't know. Which of the older gentlemen that they had on that staff last year do you think they'd, they'd kick the tires? Hey, we're going to bring them back for a year. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think any of them. To be, I mean, I don't think you're going to bring – I don't think uh, Lester's coming back, period. I think he's done – I mean, he's won 200 ball games, three world championships. What more does he need at this point? Uh, Jay Happ was okay. He's a manager, but he's a guy who's going to give you five innings. I've got to find people who can give me six or seven minimum. Uh, the five and fly guy is killing bullpens all over baseball. So you've got to find someone who's durable – but you also need to find somebody who, who can be your flex guy because I think we've noticed that, you know, to have the same starters for an entire season is almost impossible. So you better have somebody else with experience who can come out of the bullpen and give you quality starts unless you have somebody in your minor league system that, that you think is ready. I didn't see it last year. Maybe it's Jake Woodford. I don't know. But I didn't see it out of Oviedo. We haven't seen Libertor yet from all accounts. may not be ready. So I think you need somebody with some experience in that capacity more than anything else. So if you could only spend money on one of the three spots, shortstop, DH, or starting pitcher, you would be more inclined to spend the money on the starting pitcher or the DH? Yeah, I, I, would, I would spend it on the starting pitcher because as we learned this year, all you had to do is watch the World Series and see how valuable starting pitching was. The Dodgers didn't have enough of it, and they, I mean, enough of it. And uh, the team they lost to had just a little bit more. So it's just one of those situations where you hope maybe you can find a left-handed bat somewhere. But you know, who's to say that you can't get them both at the right prices? 
you know, maybe they're short-term deals. I, I think sometimes we get caught up in saying we've got to give this guy a five-year deal. I just don't know if that's always the most viable way to approach it right now. Yeah, and let's face it, the Houston Astros could be the world champions right now if Lance McCullers and Justin Verlander were, were healthy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, they, they had some other guys that, you know, that they could have used a little bit more. You know, if Zach Granke was just a little younger, I mean, who knows? You know, it, it came down to pitching more than anything else, and that's something that we, we just have to take into account. While we may think we have enough, I'm of the belief you never have enough, especially in the direction that the game is going today where bullpens have had so much more of an impact and starters have been required to do less. All right, let's talk uh, Mizzou. Uh, The good news is they covered the spread. The bad news is they were basically never in the game. Uh, Tyler Macon. Here's the thing about that. You make a point. They weren't in the game, but I thought Missouri beat themselves more than Georgia did, especially in the first half. I mean, there were some plays that they just didn't make, and it wasn't. They had Georgia. I won't say they had Georgia on the heels, but Georgia had to step back and take a deep breath for a second because Missouri had put them in some situations they weren't accustomed to seeing on a regular basis. So I thought it was more self-defeat than Georgia coming in and kicking the, kicking the tires off of them. Tyler Macon had a really good like uh, opening series or two. He had like 35 to 40 rushing yards and looked good. But, boy, that atmosphere, he didn't throw the ball well. And I'm telling you, what he did at East St. Louis was not as a runner. It was as a pure thrower. But now you watch that game, you think, is he going to be a big-time thrower in the SEC? It's one game, number one team in the country, best defense in America. It was just kind of a a tough thing for him. Yeah, you know what? Here's the thing. I don't think he forgot how to throw. I, I think a lot of times we saw him throwing on the run. You know, I think you, you saw him in high school. I saw him in high school. He can drop back with anybody and turn it loose. I, I just think it comes down to what plays they felt comfortable with him using. And I think the more snaps that he gets, the more broad his, his repertoire will be. So uh, I'm not going to base his throwing skills on what I saw on Saturday because I, I've seen him throw before. Um, I think I'd like to see him more in a drop back situation. Uh, but he's got great running skills, so and I understand you want to spread the defense, but I'm, I'm going to hold off on, on assessing him as a passer. Uh, I, I think he's got more potential to be a better passer than what we've seen in one game because we saw a pretty good body of work in high school. And, and granted, East St. Louis didn't play Georgia or Vanderbilt or Tennessee. They played you know, other high school teams, but I think his skill set is the reason why Missouri thought he was a good player, and, and Missouri wasn't his only option. Yeah, that's a great point. So right now, Mike, Mizzou is at uh, four and five, and it's not going to get – I mean, they're not playing great teams, South Carolina, but they've had some moments. Florida's been disappointing, but they've had moments, and then you finish with Arkansas. I, mean, I could picture them losing all three or maybe winning one. What do you think? I think they can win two of the three. I really do. Um, you know, the, the defense is what it is, okay? I mean – you can start from the line of scrimmage where they get pushed around. Your linebackers are not in the right lanes and make good quality tackles in the corners. I, I don't – this this eight-yard cushion is killing them. I mean, I was having this conversation with someone this morning. You know, you're giving these guys eight-yard cushions, and the next thing you know is second and two. I mean, they just have to fall down. And, and I don't know whether these guys don't have enough confidence in the press or, or what. But you can't give guys that sort of cushion. If you, if you feel you're going to get beat, then we have two problems. Your lack of confidence and maybe no, no safety play on top. But you, you can't keep giving these guys that kind of cushion and not expect them to stick it down your throat. So South Carolina this weekend, and they just blasted Florida 40-17. to 17. They beat them so bad that Dan Mullen fired a couple of members of his coaching staff. But they've been, you know, look, they've beaten the Troys of the world. They played Kentucky close like Mizzou. Uh, they beat East Carolina. You know, the craziest thing about Mizzou, Mike, is that they their most impressive Saturday afternoon was the loss to Kentucky. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> right. Uh, when they had all things clicking now, Kentucky was a unique team where they they weren't as well-rounded, you know, offensively. But, you know, what they did have was pretty good. The defense was solid. You know, and, and again, I think Missouri has shown flashes of, of coming out of it. 
especially offensively. Uh, again, the defense, I, I'm almost ready to raise a white flag and surrender on because I don't know how you can fix it in midseason because I don't think you have enough good players. Um, but with that said, maybe Missouri's got to be more of a ground control team compared to putting on the air show every every week. You got to go, you have a good running back in Beatty uh, who can ground it for a bit, and maybe if you can dunk down the ball on the other team, you're going to have to go in order to beat some teams. All right, uh, quick NBA thought. Our guy Brad Beal, for the first time in his career, is on a team that's actually winning some games. Wesley Unsell Jr., doing a terrific job. Brad not shooting it quite like he will and has his whole career, but it's kind of cool to see him on a team that's actually winning some games. Man, I think the word team, Frank, is what we're talking about. And maybe Brad doesn't have to score as much. I think that's something we need to take into account. And we've seen good players sacrifice scoring to get others engaged offensively. And and maybe we'll see that with Brad. Um, You know, the other thing is, there's no other option. You know, I mean, and last year, you know, they, they couldn't double him because Westbrook was a pretty good player. And I still think he will be with the Lakers. I think it's just going to take a little bit more time. But when you can't double Brad and you give him a look at really out of his hands, uh, you're going to see guys score 30-plus points a night. Now with his distribution being a little bit more even, Maybe he doesn't have to score as much, and once he gets used to not pressing, feeling like he's got to score at 35, uh, that's going to make that team better. Now, better, what does that mean? Are they a playoff contender? Well, you know, they were on the cusp of it last year. Who knows where it takes them, but I like the team concept that they're running with at West Huntsville Jr. Um, that's that's the good news um, in the NBA. The bad news, Mike, is the New Orleans Pelicans. And I think the Charlotte Bobcats in 2012, I think, were 7-59. and 59, And the 76er team, we remember from 73, went 9-73. and 73. But I think there's a realistic chance that this New Orleans team, if Zion doesn't come back or if he comes back weighing 300, they have a chance to have one of the worst teams in the history of basketball. They're 1-9. and nine, There is no hope at all. You know, that I was thinking, remember that Philadelphia 76er team in the 70s that what, won 19, 20 games? Fred Carter. Yeah, Fred Carter, uh, he, they, they kind of have that look. And, and I don't think – see, I was never the biggest Zion believer. I think he was a dominant player in, in college for sure. But, you know, you mentioned his weight, and that's always been an issue. <clears throat> and I just don't know if he's going to be the answer for a team that is, is truly floundering. I mean, they got rid of a coach thinking that was a problem, and they've gotten off to a very poor start now. And to put the onus that he can come back and save this team in this season, man, I just don't know. Because nobody's seen Zion. They don't know what he looks like. And and I think that's a bigger concern.